Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, Episode 3.3, The New Charters. We began our series on the Dominion of New England and subsequent Glorious Revolution back in Episode 2.21. This series has spanned portions of two seasons, including today, is made up of 13 episodes and one supplement. This makes it the second longest series we have done to date on this show, falling just short of our introduction to New England back during the first season. However, all good things must come to an end, and today it is time for us to wrap up the Glorious Revolution in our story. In some places, the Glorious Revolution in North America had already come to an end. We have already seen the revolt in Maryland, for instance, which was largely successful. Baltimore was out in the call and received a royal charter. We, of course, covered all of that back in episode 3.1, so just a couple of weeks ago. This week, therefore, we are going to be turning our attention back to the North and all of those old Dominion of New England colonies to see what would happen to them next. By the time that 1692 rolled around, the colonists had been waiting around in a nervous stupor for three years. The colonists, especially those in Massachusetts, had spent years arguing the twin pillars of the Glorious Revolution in the Dominion. First was their battle to justify their actions in the overthrow of Edmund Andros. That battle to paint their actions as being something that was deeply patriotic and showed their connections to the new monarchs, rather than a reactionary event where they overthrew a royal governor. Beyond that, however, the colonists had to deal with the questions of the future. The Boston riots in April of 1689 lasted only two days. Everything after that was a battle to see what comes next. This would ultimately restore the divisions that we discussed last time between the members of the old Puritan faction and the moderates. The Puritan faction wanted to see the restoration of their old charter, the one from pre-1686. The moderates, however, had no interest in returning to Puritan rule as they had known it before. While the faction members had become increasingly powerful following 1689, they did remain in a difficult position. First, whether they liked it or not, the overthrow of the Dominion had opened up a spot for the moderates. It was now impossible for the faction to claim sole victory over Andros, as the moderates had been central to making it happen. Furthermore, for the new monarchs William and Mary, they largely held the same feelings as did James II when it came to the colonies. There is no question that they would have been interested in curtailing the troublesome autonomy that had formed in Massachusetts which is exactly what the Dominion of New England was meant to do in the first place. The Puritans were not without their advantages, however. It had, after all, been one of their own and increased Mather that had been negotiating for the colony. Mather, if you'll recall, had escaped Andros's clutches years before, and after that point had been acting as an agent representing the interests of the colony back in London. Mather had been busy feeding information back to New England for years about the events in London as well as giving them instructions about the directions that the political winds were blowing. And while we cannot attribute the events of April 1689 to any one person or group, do keep in mind that if there was any one person who we could attribute it to, it would probably be Cotton Mather, the son of Increase Mather, who was among the biggest driving forces in sending Andros packing. Well, Increase Mather was, no doubt, an ardent Puritan. He also remained consistently pragmatic in his approach. This would become clear in early 1690. When Edmund Andros returned to England, he was accompanied by Thomas Oates and Elijah Cook. Both of these men had been prominent members of the Puritan faction prior to the Dominion, and they were undoubtedly sent along to help reset the events back to where they had been prior to 1686. However, it quickly became apparent that these men, rather than aiding Mather, stood as a hindrance to him. Mather had by this point figured out the truth of the matter. The old charter was dead, and it was never coming back. The best strategy, therefore, was not fighting to accomplish an impossible end, namely restoring the charter, but was rather to fight and make sure that the replacement was as tolerable as possible. Cook and Oates were far slower to accept that reality, much to the considerable consternation of Increase Mather. One of the biggest problems for the colonists is that as 1690 was ushered in, much of the revolutionary fervor in London began to settle down. If you will recall, the Whigs were not exactly friends with James II, and had in fact done what they could to exclude him from the throne altogether. 
Following the Glorious Revolution, they were no doubt riding high. However, by early 1690, a lot of that early anger had begun to subside. This was a good thing for Edmund Andros, who was being brought over to defend what had happened in Massachusetts. However, for Increase Mather and the other agents, this was a whole lot less than ideal. This difficult position became obvious during the trial of Andros when the agents refused to sign the complaint against him. Now, the agents refused to sign the paperwork because they claimed that the charges were brought by the people of Massachusetts and that no one individual could sign the charges. More realistically, the agents had sensed the fact that Andros would almost certainly be acquitted and none of them wanted to be left holding the liability for his long imprisonment. This provided a nice excuse for the Crown to dismiss the charges outright. But it also tells us something more about the situation in London. It served as a clue that the sentiments in England were not towards the execution of Andros, but that his acquittal by this point was virtually preordained. The Crown wanted a way out of having to execute or even punish Andros, and as soon as they found something, they jumped on it. It is evidence that the government in England was moving on from the previous year and served as a signal to the colonial agents that support for the rebellion had likely already peaked. Furthermore, Despite the fact that it offered the crown a way to avoid having to answer difficult questions regarding Andros and his behavior, William III was not amused by the refusal of the Massachusetts agents to sign the complaint. While Oates and Cook failed to recognize the reality, Mather saw the writing on the wall and pivoted to getting the best deal possible. Mather relied on the argument that the overthrow of the Dominion had been nothing more than an expression of the greater glorious revolution. This provided Mather with the underlying justification for the actions taken. At the same time, however, Mather worked to differentiate Massachusetts from the other English colonies. While well, Mather argued that the colonists were indeed owed the same rights as all Englishmen, he also stressed that the Massachusetts colony remained in a covenant with God. So what end was Mather trying to accomplish with this argument? Mather argued to the king that this covenant would make it difficult for the crown to appoint a governor that the colonists would accept. That this special relationship meant that the colonists should be allowed to pick leadership that was acceptable to them. The problem for Mather is that despite his hard fight, William just was not sympathetic to the plight of the colonists. He undoubtedly understood the arguments that they were fighting in a theater of the Glorious Revolution, the same Glorious Revolution that brought him to power. However, at the same time, he was also aware of the history of Massachusetts. Re-establishing not just royal prerogative, but rather his own personal prerogative over the colonies was always going to be a central concern for the new monarch. Despite all of the arguments and all of the justifications, the overwhelming feeling back in England itself is that equality between the colonies and the mother country simply did not exist. This would become increasingly clear as negotiations drug on. Oates and Cook continued to argue for the restoration of the old charter, something that was by this point as much of a waste of their time as it was likely a hindrance for Mather. When the Crown shared a proposed charter with Mather and the other agents, it was Oates and Cook that objected to numerous points that they felt impeded upon their freedoms. Mather, again forced to play the mediator in his own group, was able to shrink this down to a pair of formal objections. First, the colonists wanted the right to choose sheriffs, judges, and the other magistrates. In other words, the colonists wanted to control the entire judicial branch of the Massachusetts government. Second, though the king was allowing for a representative assembly, the agents wanted the assembly to have the unilateral right to appoint members to a council to advise the governor. What this means, therefore, is that the assembly alone would have the right to choose the council. The governor would have no veto nor any say-so on who sat on his own personal council. The colonists, by wanting to control the council, sought a way to ensure that they permanently had the governor's ear to the exclusion of everybody else. The crown's response to this said a whole lot. The king rejected all of the proposals. The argument made to William was that granting such power to the colonists would in effect cause him to sacrifice his powers over the colonies. William had no interest in sacrificing his own authority 
and was not about to grant such powers to the colonists. The king had made clear what had been apparent to Mather for months. Those living in the colonies did not share the same rights as natural-born Englishmen. Rather, any rights that the colonists were granted were completely and totally illusory. The colonists did not have any rights. Rather, what they had were gifts granted to them by the monarch. The freedom and rights that the charter confirmed were not granted as a result of some birthright, but rather they were something conveyed to the colonists by a distant monarch. More importantly was the stark realization that if the monarch was granting these gifts to the colonists, so could he take them away. Suddenly, Massachusetts was far more vulnerable to the political tides in London than they had ever been before. Signed on October the 7th, 1691, the new charter itself did actually remain fairly liberal for a colonial charter. The new charter installed a royal governor in Massachusetts, though the king had agreed that at least for the first governor, he would consult with the Massachusetts agents in making that choice. To be clear, this was not an agreement to consult with them on all future governors, rather just the first one. The king retained the right to make unilateral decisions on royal governance. Massachusetts was guaranteed an assembly which, as we discussed a moment ago, had the right to pick the council, though the governor did retain the ultimate veto power over it. Likewise, the king would also retain the right to select the sheriffs and the magistrates throughout the colony. Importantly, the king did also take this opportunity to go ahead and confirm all of the land titles previously held in Massachusetts, something that had been such a serious sticking point during the Dominion years under Andros. The king as well as the governor would hold full veto power over bills coming out of the assembly, though the king did agree that he would place a three-year time limit on his own personal veto, which removes the risk of large-scale actions years later. While the colonists were likely going to be relieved to have retained their right to have an assembly, as well as have at least some degree of input towards the governor's council, the new charter did come with some devastating blows. For the Puritans, the biggest of these was the end of religious discrimination in voting. Moving forward, the right to vote was going to be tied to property requirements rather than religion, as long as the voter was Protestant and not Catholic. We have discussed since our first season how limiting the vote to the members of the Puritan Church is how the Puritan faction had retained their power for so long. If you fell outside the accepted norms of the colony's ruling class, they could simply exclude you from the vote and effectively silence your voice in colonial politics. For the moderates in Massachusetts, this was a huge victory, as it essentially spelled the end of the Puritan hegemony that had come to dominate the colony since its founding. Massachusetts was, of course, not the only colony in New England that was waiting to hear about their political future. For Connecticut and Rhode Island, their future was quickly made clear enough. Back in episode 2.26, we had talked about what may have seemed like a minor point at the time, chiefly that Connecticut and Rhode Island had voluntarily set aside their charters and accepted Dominion control. Unlike in Massachusetts, where the charter had been officially revoked through the Quo Waranto process, no such action ever became official in Connecticut or Rhode Island. That's not necessarily for a lack of effort on the part of England. There were a few unsuccessful attempts to legally challenge the Connecticut Charter. However, ultimately, the agreement when they joined the Dominion is that their charters would not be legally voided. This provided those colonies with something of a life raft that Massachusetts was so sorely missing. That Massachusetts Charter had been legally voided, and therefore they had no legal right to operate following April 1689, when the Dominion of New England collapsed. They did return to operating as though the Charter still existed, however, this was always going to be a temporary state for the colony. When it came time for William III to decide what to do with the colonies, the decision was easy enough for Rhode Island and Connecticut. They still had valid legal charters. The solution, therefore, was simply to go ahead and restore the charters as they used to be. After all, the charters had never been revoked, just temporarily set aside. Among the colonies facing the biggest problems was Plymouth. Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island all held in common that they were, at some point, granted charters from the Crown. Sure, Massachusetts had ultimately lost their charter, but the fact remained that they had at least held one previously. These charters had given a degree of legitimacy to the claims of those colonies to exist. 
Plymouth, however, was different. Back during Season 1, we had discussed how the colony was originally traveling with a grant to settle near the mouth of the Hudson. However, conditions at the time prevented that from happening and the colony ended up being founded near Cape Cod. The Pilgrims at the time had recognized that there was a problem and that they lacked the authority to settle the area. The outcome of this was the Mayflower Compact, which they hoped would give them some kind of legitimacy. The problem is that the Mayflower Compact was never anything official between the Crown and the settlers. It was a pact between those from the Lighting Congregation and those from outside the congregation who were on board the Mayflower to work together for the mutual good of the colony. Whereas Rhode Island and Connecticut were not founded in London but rather in North America, both of those colonies were ultimately able to secure an official charter, with Rhode Island receiving theirs in 1663. Now, in the name of being correct, I do want to, not necessarily correct an error, but clarify something from episode 1.23, when we talked about Roger Williams. Williams had secured a charter from Parliament in 1644. However, it never actually became official as the king had failed to sign it. So the framework was in place, and there was at least something officially recognizing the existence of the colony in London. However, it would take another 19 years for the king, then Charles II, to officially sign off on the 1644 charter, hence turning it into the Charter of 1663. Connecticut, for their part, would receive their official charter in 1662. Plymouth had remained a small colony and never actually was able to earn their official charter. There were certainly attempts made, but the colony continually lacked the influence in London to make a charter a reality. For Plymouth, this was a very serious concern following the collapse of the Dominion of New England. While the other colonies were busy stressing out over the issues of what a future charter might look like, they had all at least at some point held a charter making their existence legitimate. Plymouth had initially hoped that it would survive this storm and sent Ichabod Wisewall to help advocate on behalf of the colony. Unfortunately for Plymouth, not only did the king not have plans for a charter for the small colony, but there were sharks in the water, chiefly New York, that were angling to grow their holdings and annex Plymouth outright. Wisewall was interested in trying to save Plymouth and finally get a charter for the first New England colony. By this time, Increase Mather had become aware of a plan to annex Plymouth into New York, something that he fought to stop. Likely as motivated by religion as geopolitical considerations, Mather instead argued that Plymouth should be included in the Massachusetts Charter. For Mather, the last thing that he wanted is for New York to have any more of a foothold inside of New England proper. For the Plymouth colonists, there was certainly an outpouring of anger at the proposed end of their colony, and Wisewell demanded that Mather drop his attempt to annex the colony into Massachusetts. However, even for Wisewell, it was quickly becoming clear that saving the colony was not going to be an option. In what has become kind of a running theme throughout this podcast, nobody ever wanted to be annexed into New York. Massachusetts was the more palatable choice for the Plymouth colonists. Resigned to their fate, the fight was dropped, and along with the new Massachusetts Charter came the end of the Plymouth Colony. In addition to Plymouth, Massachusetts had also tried to extend their reach significantly during these negotiations. Originally, the colony was making claims on both Maine and New Hampshire as well. The Crown would end up agreeing to allow the annexation of Maine. However, New Hampshire would become an independent royal colony of its own. So, if you're keeping score at home, the new Massachusetts Charter had granted the colony both Maine and Plymouth for annexation, however split New Hampshire off into its own thing. Our final colony of the day is New York. When we last left off, we were at the end of Leisler's Rebellion, with the rebel leader hanging from the gallows. With the rebellion itself officially over, however, there still remained the question of what to do with the colony itself. Anger towards the Dominion had never been at the same level in New York as it was with their neighbors to the north in New England. Therefore, in the immediate aftermath to the end of Leisler's Rebellion, you do see men who had been loyal to the Dominion, and indeed Edmund Andrus himself, move back into positions of power. Immediately before the death of Leisler, the New York Assembly had issued the rights and privileges of their majesty's subjects, inhabiting within their province of New York. 
otherwise known as the Declaratory Act. This document was, in so many ways, what we had seen New York fighting for from the moment it became an English colony. Specifically, the colonists wanted the right to a representative assembly, and they wanted those rights guaranteed to Englishmen extended to them. Now, as much as you all know how much I enjoy going through political documents like this, we can go ahead and hold off on doing that with the rights and privileges, as it is pretty much the exact same thing as the New York Charter of Liberties that we discussed way back in episode 2.6. You know, that charter where the king had promised that he was going to go ahead and sign it and never actually got around to doing it? Well, as it turns out, the passage of time had not made the New York colonists any less interested in their own personal rights. The colonists did acknowledge and thank William and Mary for giving them a temporary assembly. However, they made clear that they wanted something more official. This returns us to the same problem that we had seen in Massachusetts. A right given to the colonists by the king, but not directly written into a royal charter, was a dangerous thing indeed. Shifting political winds could change the necessity for that right to exist. In other words, if the king can make such a grant, he can just as easily take it away. Therefore, the assembly in New York made clear that they wanted something more official than a promise from the king. They wanted actual hard legislation. William III, much as James II did, agreed to the legislation. The difference, however, is that William III actually would sign the legislation making things official. New York would finally have a legal and permanent assembly. The statute that the king signed agreed that New York would have a royal governor, a council, and a representative general assembly. The statute did grant both the governor and the king veto power over anything passed by the assembly. Likewise, it established the right of the colonists under the Magna Carta and the basic rights that followed with it. Despite all of the changes that the colonists had so long fought for, New York politics would remain a tense, highly factionalized affair for years to come. Leisler was dead. However, both his supporters and detractors would fight in the assembly for years following his death. Beyond that, moving forward, the government back in London would continue to insist that, past statute or not, the rights to the assembly and the rights granted by the statute were still something that the king allowed, not something that was a natural right owed to the colonists. The problem, however, is that ultimately, despite the Declaratory Act having been passed, it did little to protect the colonists from those changing political winds. In 1696, the newly minted Lord of Trade in London reviewed not only the proposed laws of New York, but turned to the Declaratory Act itself. The board turned on the fact that the act granted far too much autonomy to New Yorkers. Returning to the concept that natural English rights did not extend to the colonists, they were able to convince William III to revoke that act that he had agreed to some years before. Members of the Lords of Trade did suggest that New York be granted a royal charter in the aftermath of the act being invalidated. However, those conversations gained little traction. Therefore, any assembly being granted to the colonists in New York came only by the grace of the king and not as a result of any greater rights as Englishmen. I started moving through what was at first the Dominion of New England, and then later the greater glorious revolution in the colonies, all the way back in episode 2.21. We have spent the last 13 episodes, plus one supplement, talking about these events that would completely redefine virtually all the northern colonies and Maryland during the 1680s and 90s. Throughout these episodes, there have been a few things that have really stood out as being the lasting legacy of a decade of upheaval throughout the colonies. For the Puritans in Massachusetts, the events that we have been talking about were absolutely devastating. The Puritans had fought so hard and for so long to hold on to power and maintain their autonomy that they had so long cherished. Despite attempts previously to break up the Puritan hegemony that had formed, the Dominion of New England was that fatal blow though probably not in the way that the Puritans originally had expected. The Puritans must have felt defeated when they held their last assembly meeting in 1686. They knew at that moment that they had lost and they were quickly removed from power by Andros. However, following the fall of the Dominion three years later, it is impossible not to believe that there must have been at least some hope of being able to get back to where they had once been. Well, back in Massachusetts, there was hope to return to a period of Puritan domination. In London, Increase Mather was far more realistic about those chances. Mather, as we have discussed, recognized that there simply was no going back to the way that things had been. 
However, for the Puritan faction, it could not have been much worse, short of sending them Edmund Andros back and reestablishing the Dominion. The new charter specifically removed those voting restrictions that had guaranteed the Puritans remain firmly in control of the colony. Beyond that, there was now going to be a royal governor. Sure, the assembly would still exist. However, it was now subject to veto power from both the royal governor and the king. This all shapes up to be a massive loss for the autonomy of the Bay Colony. For a colony that had largely been operating independent of the crown from their very founding, the new charter meant a new reality, one that would force the colony into alignment with English imperial policy. Beyond official changes to the charters or imperial policy, I really want to focus on that question that we've begun talking about throughout the series, specifically the role of the North American colonies in the greater English realm. This is a question that would come up to help define the relationship between the colonies and the mother country moving forward. The colonies were suddenly going to be forced to, if not accept, at a minimum acknowledge the reality that England did not view them as being equal. The king had made the position clear that the colonies did not fall under the protections that were afforded to Englishmen born back in the home islands. Rather, the colonists were completely dependent upon the monarch for their rights. If the colonists were allowed to decide matters of their own destiny and hold assemblies, that was because the king had so graciously allowed it, not because it was a natural right as an Englishman demanding it. One of the themes that we are going to see over and over this season is a changing dynamic between the colonies and the crown. Following the Glorious Revolution, William III was in a position where he had to reassert royal prerogative. He had to get the colonies to fall into line. However, what we're going to see moving forward through this season into the 18th century is the crown vacillating between two extremes. At times, the crown is going to come out and heavily regulate the colonies, while at other times, during that famous period of salutary neglect, which we'll get to later on this season, the colonies are going to largely be left to their own devices. Then the entire cycle would swing in the other direction again. As we are going to see, this is going to really define the next 75 years of colonial history, and it is going to help explain just where the colonies sit on the verge of the American Revolution at the end of the season. These questions, therefore, of rights as natural-born Englishmen simply are not going away. During the 1760s, just as we have seen over this past series, it will be cries of arbitrary government that are going to be thrown around by the American colonists towards the British. The key difference, however, is that when this goes down in the 1760s, it is going to start the ball rolling slowly towards independence. Where the colonies stand right now, therefore, is in a place largely of renewed royal authority. On paper, at least, England was far more powerful in the colonies now than when we had started season two. Puritan hegemony is gone in New England, which would hopefully mean increased profit for the crown. Maryland is out of the hands of Lord Baltimore and now in the hands of the crown as well. The rebels in New York are gone and the colony is again back under control. As we move forward this season, keep that question in your mind that I have kept repeating. What is the place of the North American colonies in the greater English empire? This is the question that we are going to keep coming back to time and time again, all the way up until 1776, when the Second Continental Congress will send King George III an answer to that question in the form of the Declaration of Independence. This question is going to continue to simmer right under the surface for the remainder of the colonial era. While the king may have made his point pretty clear as to that relationship in the aftermath of the Glorious Revolution, it is not going to stop the colonists from demanding their rights as English citizens. Next time, we are going to remain in Massachusetts and travel to Salem, where just as the colony was about to learn of the new charters in 1692, allegations of witchcraft began to spread. Our next two episodes are going to detail what would become one of the most infamous events in colonial history, the Salem Witchcraft Trials. Until then, I hope you all have a wonderful two weeks, that you are staying healthy, and that you are staying safe. And I will see you back here then, as we begin to examine exactly what was about to go down in Salem. <laughs>